um, and building buildings is is the the core activity of the OPW. Am I if I may. Thank you. Hi, Deputy. Yeah, absolutely. And just to assure you that the department works very closely with the Office of Public Works and each of the individual national cultural institutions as we move them through the various procurement phases. All of the projects have oversight groups in place uh, and uh, at earlier stages we call them interim working groups comprised of officials from the department, from the governance unit within the department, which oversees the individual institution, the Project Ireland 2040 office, the Office of Public Works, and as I say, the cultural institution. We provide resources to the cultural institutions to, to, to uh, procure the uh, design expertise, the project management expertise, to manage the phases of the uh, project that they're at. And separate to that, the department and the Office of Public Works have a programme level oversight group which keeps an overview of all of the projects, which uh, comprises a uh, commissioner, the state architect, myself, uh, my colleague Patricia Murphy from our governance side, and various representatives from uh, the OPW and the department. So, as I say, we work very closely with them uh, and uh, we are moving them all very carefully through the uh, the, the various phases under the public spending code. In relation to the uh, the code, there are a number of decision gates around strategic assessment, the business case, the pre-tender approval, approval to proceed at the final business case, and all of those are subject to the approval of the minister. Uh, we meet on a... Uh, these groups typically meet every two months, every eight weeks, depending on, again, the phase of the project that we're at. Uh, the, the models that we've had, I suppose, have been based on the learnings we've had from the National Gallery, which uh, delivered a very successful outcome in terms of the transformation of the National Gallery. And as the Secretary General has alluded to, we have completed phase one of the works at the National Library, which has seen a significant risk to a national collection in the West Wing of the National Library uh, completely mitigated, which is a very significant outcome. And as we move to the next phase, there are investigative works underway at present by the Office of Public Works to establish the physical fabric of the building, as the Secretary General has referred to, so that we can form, have a good evidence basis for estimating the costs of the next phase of the works, and which in turn will uh, inform the design uh, and uh, Thank before you, we go to procurement, etc. So look, I suppose Thank that's you. an overview, Deputy. If there's anything there that Thank you'd you. like me to elaborate on, I'm no, happy to do I, so. I, I appreciate that. We'll, we'll, we'll examine that further, I think, as time, as time goes on. So thank you, thank you for that. Uh, I want to move on to quite a bespoke issue, and that's the issue of, of storage uh, within the cultural uh, institutions. Uh, my understanding is that uh, there is a storage facility for the National uh, Museum uh, in particular, and that is housed in Swords. So the National Museum of Ireland's uh, Collections Resource Centre in Swords, it houses four million objects, which is an extraordinary figure when you think about it. Uh, I'm just wondering what the future holds for storage of uh, key objects in our national collections, regardless of which institution that is. Because I understand in the NMI case that uh, there's only eight years remaining on the existing lease and that a rent review that was due in September 2020 uh, was still not uh, concluded. There is a, an issue there where if you're seeking to animate any of the projects that I've outlined previously, you are going to have to decant uh, many of the artefacts or pieces, whether it's artistic pieces or otherwise, to, to other sites. How are you dealing with the issue of storage of these precious, precious items within our national collections, and specifically in relation to the NMI? How are you, what are you doing to ensure that there's a sustainable storage facility for for the NMI and for other cultural institutions. Thank you, Deputy. Um, I, I might say you're correct to raise this issue. Um, the storage issue is very important to us. We've worked very closely with the NMI um, on the storage. Uh, they use that storage facility not just for storage, but also for researchers coming to access the collections to work on them. Um, so I might just ask Connor again to go into more detail because we have had a lot of engagements. The facility, I think, is under a contract with OPW and we've had an awful lot of engagement with the NMI and with OPW on this particular site. 
Yeah, it's it's a, it's a site we share with the uh, heritage colleagues in uh, in the Department of uh, Housing, uh, Local Government and Heritage. Uh, it, it is an issue, Deputy. It is on the agenda, I suppose, is all I can say to you at present. Chair, it is, uh, I, it Chair, is a matter may, of may I intervene? May I? I have 40 seconds left in my slot. Okay. So, Connor, don't tick down the clock on me now, please. Give I, me a very okay. specific answer in the very short 30 seconds that I've left. Okay. We, we, we are engaged with the NMI and the OPW in relation to the issue, and we're very mindful of the, the timelines. That's not an answer, Chair, with all due respect. I, what I'd like to know is, there was a rent, I asked a specific question about rent reviews. What was the outcome of the rent review? And can you assure this committee and the people of Ireland de facto that beyond 2030 or 2030 onwards that there will be a fit-for-purpose modern uh, uh, storage facility for any collection uh, within the national collection, be that a piece of art or be that uh, uh, the, the remains of an Irish elk, for instance? Well, what I could say, deputies, we'll revert to you on the rent review because I don't have figures in front of us here. Um, but certainly I can tell you we are very mindful of the importance of this facility and making sure that there is a facility to properly house the collections. That is a priority for us, I can assure you of that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I just uh, ask a number of questions myself. Um, uh, just, just to pick up on one of the points that uh, Deputy Sherlock made in relation to uh, the culture, cultural institutions, and um, I visited the National Library myself in in about ten years ago. I was horrified at the, uh, at the at the condition the collection was held in. I'm very pleased that uh, that significant risk to the. Um, uh, to the, the you know the, that collection has been mitigated and that work is absolutely necessary and let me say that and uh, uh, the same issue in relation to the national archives archives and the problems with storage so I'm completely on board with uh, the need for these projects um, but to pick up on the point in relation to uh, controlling costs uh, the National Gallery my understanding is that the the cost the uh, the original estimate was somewhere uh, around 25 million and the uh, is it is it the case that that came in at 52 million and that's that's under negotiation or um, that that has been um, arbitrated at the moment what our conciliation at the moment what is the story with that uh, yeah, Deputy, it is the subject of a process at the moment. Maybe, Connor, you might want to elaborate. I don't know that we can, because we haven't actually landed on the final figure yet, yeah, I don't think we can give you a final figure. Yeah, Connor. short response, please, because very limited time. Yeah, sure. Yeah, ju just to confirm that it is the subject of a process, but given the sensitivity of it, I wouldn't like to expand are those, without... Are those figures correct? Um, we've confirmed the figures for you. I, I don't have them to hand directly. Uh, but they're, they're, they're ballpark. the ballpark. Are they ballpark yeah, correct? The the, the 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 original figure, the twenty-five sounds a little low, if you know what I mean. And I I, I wouldn't really want to comment on something which is the subject of the. Uh, you the must know what bill was. Well, we we we'll we'll come back to you, deputy. On we'll the come figures. back to you, deputy. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. With precise figures, yeah. But, okay. but I, whether we, can, we can't probably comment on the final figure, obviously, because it's subject of a process, but we can certainly come with the initial es estimation. I mean, things have changed even since then in terms of how we walk through the public spending code. And so, for example, in the library, I share your horror, actually. I went on the same tour and saw the drains coming down beside the old newspapers from the 1920s, I think it was. Um, and uh, part of the process now is to come in and do investigative works yeah. Um, okay. I before, mean, I, I, before I, you I, get into planning, I, yeah. I completely understand that. Um, um, the just want to uh, because it's very limited time, and we'll all have the same issues in relation to time. Just in relation to the um, was there was there a value for money review done in relation to the Ryder Cup uh, in 2006? Um, obviously, there's a commitment uh, to host the Ryder Cup in 2027. Um, just yes or no, was there a value for money? There was a, there was a review done. Uh, Deputy, if you can just hold on for a minute. Um, I'll just get a note on it. Thanks, Millen. Um, 
So yeah, Fault Ireland in conjunction with PGA and the European Tour commissioned Deloitte and Touche to conduct an, an economic impact assessment of the Ryder Cup in Ireland. And according to that report, the findings which were announced, I think, in April 20, 2007, the Ryder Cup was worth a record 143 million to the Irish economy, uh, and the total direct and economic impact figure of 143 million exceeded the pre-event predictions of 130 million, and represented an increase of 32% on the impact of the Ryder Cup in England and 80% on foot of that uh, in the 1997 Ryder okay. Cup in Spain. Uh, the report confirmed. Uh, previous reported perceptions about our visitor experience uh, with over 80% of visitors suggesting okay. that they would re so return to can, Ireland can, can in I the just, future. Yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I just ask that you provide us with that? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. With that report, yeah. that would be very useful because just... Yes. And what has been expended to date um, on, on the uh, 2027 uh, event? Um, I haven't got the. F I'll just get the figures here, or maybe Kia, my colleague Kian, you you have the figures. I think for the right. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Sec Chairman, thanks, Deputy. Uh, what's been spent so far? There's been a payment of 3.2 million to Ryder Cup Europe LLP in 2020, and obviously there will be ongoing payments between now and 2027. So 3.2 million to date. And are you have a schedule, have you, for each year? Um, there is a broad agree there is an agreement uh, with Ryder Cup Europe. Uh, elements of it are commercially sensitive, but we, we can absolutely supply in indicative figures if between you, now and 20, 2027 to give, to give you the overall picture on that. If you would, please. And are there, uh, are there additional major sporting events that the, the department has made commitments to other than the Ryder Cup? Um, yes, yes, uh, Deputy. Um, at the moment, uh, we have made a financial commitment to uh, support the scoping of a bid for the 2030 uh, FIFA World Cup. Um, no money is paid so far, um, but we reckon that by next summer, uh, a few hundred thousand will have been spent on that. At that point, uh, government will need to take a decision as to whether to proceed with the bid. Um, and, and, in the relation, that, and in relation sorry. to the America's Cup, was there any money expended on that? Um, what's happening with the America's Cup is we are in the middle of a six-month further assessment process. Uh, the department has allocated uh, additional staff and resources to work on that, so there's there there's a team working on that. Uh, the expenditure to date is effectively staff time. Uh, there will probably be uh, some expenditure then on economic and other specific appraisals. Okay. Uh, and the intention is to have that piece of work finished by end March, early April. Okay. And in relation to the euro, uh, the euros which we were originally supposed to host, what what was expended on that? Um, Deputy, I, I come back to you with the price, precise figure on that. I if don't have it right to my fingertips, but I know you're con conscious of time, so I, yeah. I come back to you with the if precise would, figure on if that. If you would, please. I just want to turn very quickly to the Galway 2020. Um, I mean, the the amount of sponsorship um, uh, was... It, obviously, it was anticipated there would be more than there was. At what point did you... Um, did the department realise that um, it would go beyond the 50% that was committed? And indeed, if you start adding in the local authorities' contributions, it, you know, it was, wasn't far off 80% uh, spend. I mean, what, uh, at what point did you realise um, that the... That the, the that there wasn't going to be the sponsorship um, and there wasn't the local commitment uh, commercially on that? Uh, Deputy, if I could say on Galway 2020, and it really was for Galway for a city that is steeped in culture, um, this was to be its, it, one of its finest moments. And obviously the pandemic, like yeah. so many other, many other sectors, obviously um, had a huge impact on it. But if I could say that the combined public and public sector funding, so not just exchequer funding, so exchequer and local authority funding and other sources of funding for that project was to be 85%. Um, that was the combination. It became very clear to us, I suppose, the programme was launched in February of 2019 and then the pandemic hit, obviously, in March. So it became very clear to us very quickly um, that, that, uh, that, the, that some elements of the funding would not 
would not uh, materialise. Uh, the local authority funding, the local authorities were hit very hard, obviously, with the rates, the they, um, loss of income to the local authorities, loss of income from things like parking, rates, etc. Um, and so I suppose we had a decision to make then whether we would continue. So the 50% exchequer, that was a that was a guide that we put out when we put out the bid first, when we put it out to the cities of Ireland to put in bids, we said it, there would be a guide of either 15 million, 15 million euros, and even at that stage it was only a guide, 15 million yep. euro, and 50% of the cost funded by Sorry, the I'm down, to, I'm down to my last minute, so um, Sorry. I, I think we do need to see a report on, on, on this and from you. I, um, is, are there assets that are, are owned um, that, that are, if you like, a legacy of this and who owns them? And was the model um, that was, you know, that was ultimately decided on, uh, did that work? Is that something that you've reviewed? Is it likely to, to be the case if we were to have another, uh, you know, a city of culture? Yes, and could I say in terms of the assets, like one of the one of the the assets are being uh, wound up. Um, uh, so, uh, and in particular, just to mention, there's like 356 per, uh, percussion instruments, which were part of part of an element of the project, um, have been donated to Galway Roscommon ETB um, for use as part of uh, music generation. Um, uh, so prior to, so following the, the expiry of its lease on the 31st of March 2021, Galway 2020 officially moved from 16 Merchants Road to its new office in Wavemaker Hub at the Corn Store in Middle Street, Galway. Prior to that, the assets identified for disposal included furniture, fixtures, fittings, ICT and technology equipment. Um, and approval was obtained from the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform for the disposal of assets. Um, I could actually give you a note on this, it would help you, yes, please, uh, um, that's, that's Deputy, you rather than walking through them yes. step by step here. But certainly there are, there's a legacy programme, there's legacy assets, um, there are artworks to go into six, um, six towns and Galway City as a consequence okay. of it. So okay. yes. Thank you. And I mean, I, I obviously uh, we'd all feel very sorry for the people who were organising it, given the, uh, given the the what was to happen, and then the yeah. pandemic. I, I think that's that's understood as well. Uh, I may come back to this issue later on, but um, uh, my time is up, so um, I'll move on to the next speaker. I understand uh, James O'Connor will be delayed, so I'll move to uh, Imelda Munster. Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, I want to just touch on um, RTE and albeit that you said the funding comes through your department, we, we know it's funded by the TV licence, but it accounts for nearly 25% of your total expenditure and the, once it comes through the department, you're tasked with handing the funding over. But I just want to touch on the fact that um, RTE had recently made a settlement with revenue for 1.2 million. Um, that was arising from the misclassification of workers or effectively bo bogus self-employment. But in June, um, in correspondence with the committee, that you'd indicated that uh, you couldn't engage on the subject as it was part of an ongoing process of revenue. But now that the settlement has been made, what actions has the department uh, taken in response or have you done anything in response to that settlement being made? Um, I think that uh, Deputy, I mean, RT is a commercial semi-state company under mm -hmm. the aegis of the department. Um, but these are operational matters for RTE. Obviously, we're very conscious of them. Um, but they are operational matters for RTE. And I know RTE has appeared before the committee and has undertaken to appear again before the committee on it. Um, and, the, and the matter is still uh, apparently with um, the Department of uh, social protection as well under consideration and there is a process ongoing. Maybe if Patricia Murphy might like to comment any further on that. Um, thanks, uh, Secretary. Uh, I, I suppose Deputy, as the Secretary says, um, uh, the, the work in, in terms of RTE with Everishes and the engagement with revenue has been completed. Social protection are still uh, wait, are doing a report and um, we, we'll, the outcome of that is actually awaited. But RTAs have also put an employment first policy in place, which we're aware of, I think, to address future issues arising. So I think the department is, is, is happy with progress in that regard. I was just asking in relation to the settlement that they had made 
and just your, your take on it, if you like. I think we are happy that RT had engaged in a process with um, with Eversheds to to address the issue, and these are very uh, complex employment law related issues, and then uh, and also dealt uh, directly with revenue in the regard. So, um, I mean, I think the department is happy that there was a process in place and an arrangement agreement has been reached, so um, that the issue has been well addressed. Would you be concerned at all about the lack of oversight? You know that the. The settlement was made as a consequence of lack of oversight. I mean, we've we've been here before. I give the the FAI as an example of the lack of oversight. Would you be concerned at all about that? Um, I think, uh, Deputy. I think from uh, the department has, I suppose, um, a good oversight process in place in relation to RTE. We have quarterly governance meetings on issues arising. Um, just in the context of the terms and conditions of staff, that really is a matter for RTE in relation to, um, I think, their independence in that matter under the Broadcasting Act. So, um, as, I, as I mentioned, there, there are very complex employment law issues, um, revenue and social protection are best advised in relation to contract of and for service issues. RTE have reviewed their processes in that regard in that case. So, I think the department is happy that the matter has been addressed and is continuing to be addressed with social protection. Okay, there's just another issue there. Um, I'd recently engaged with RTE regarding pay disparity, if you like, I suppose, that had been ongoing between um, Clar Raktari and the English language counterparts. Um, but it seems that workers are essentially being paid less if they work through the, the medium of Irish. Um, and I understand it had been going on for about 20 years, but RTE at the time claimed to be unaware of it, which I was quite surprised at. Um, and they said they would follow up with a note, and then they they didn't do that. Um, and they, they kind of reneged on that. And then they said they were carrying out a review, uh, which could take months, could take years, might never see the light of day. But just, um, again, if it comes down to being, and you said earlier about transparency and, and that, it's a hell of a lot of public money, and you would be concerned, you know, that as the department, you're responsible for the media and the Gale talks. So, Gale talks. so would you have any particular interest in an organisation that gets its funding through yourselves, implementing, if you like, a sliding scale of wages based on the language that people work through? Surely you'd have some concerns about that. If I might maybe start, Deputy, um, we're obviously as Department with responsibility for the Gaeltacht and the Irish language. We are always concerned about funding for the Irish language and about and about actions to promote the Irish language. And indeed, we've uh, increased the funding to TG Cahar last year and this year. Um, but in relation to uh, RTE, um, we understand that they are conducting a comparative review of the remuneration of Irish-speaking workers. Um, they uh, have run a public tender to engage in experts partner with the specific experience in the media sector to carry out a full ev evaluation of all staff roles and grades in RTE um, and Irish language roles will be part of this review which will complete which will commence and completion of the tender process um, so yeah it, it, it is it is important and I would say in terms of oversight of RTE and um, <clears throat> we have the BAI we have ourselves and we have new era so there is extensive oversight of RTE but obviously issues will always arise from time to time with any entity um, mm -hmm. and and, and it's it's important that they address these issues promptly. Yeah, but uh, in re again, it comes back to the, the issue of oversight. I mean, this has been going on 20 years, and it was only when it was flagged up um, and people persistently chased it that RTE are now doing what they're doing, you know, and as yet we've, we've nothing concrete from them. But the fact, again, oversight, 20 years, you know, a sliding scale of wages. Yeah, and I think I think there's a there's a wider grade structure issue that that is being looked at by RTE, not just in relation to Radio Nagelthakta. And uh, I suppose uh, all I can say is I, I welcome the fact that they are doing a review now and that they are looking at it. And I think it is very complex. I don't know, Patricia, if you want to add anything to that, but it is a complex area. It's a large organisation with a wide variety of different grade structures. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, does Patricia want to come in? 
Uh, I think, uh, Deputy, just as the Secretary General says, I think we are happy that RT have process in place to, to look at these issues. Um, and again, I suppose in the context of the terms and conditions of staff, they do have independence, but the department does have, as I say, a, a robust, and the Secretary General just referenced it, uh, oversight structure in place involving ourselves um, uh, or to ED per new area where we, where we uh, meet with them quarterly and, and go through issues. Um, and certainly um, we have... Um, we, we are happy that they have a process in place to, to address the issue and we'll, we'll await the, the, um, the conclusion of that process and the report that's, mm. that, that's, uh, that's, uh, um, that we receive at the end. Yeah, just in relation to the fact that it went on for 20 years, could I just ask, were you actually um, aware of that pay disparity between workers, depending on the language that you worked through? I suppose, Deputy, we've only had responsibility, this department has only had responsibility for the media function actually since since the summer of 2020. So obviously I wouldn't personally have been aware of it. Um, okay. You're down to your last two minutes, Deputy. Yeah, just in relation to, uh, is it not just the, the um, they're re reviewing the grades of all staff? Is that not the review that they're carrying out at the minute? Is it, or is it in relation to the, the pay disparity? I think, they're, as I understand it, they're reviewing the grades of all staff, which will include the staff of Ornegy. Yeah, but I don't know, is it, are they, is they, are they specifically looking into this? I mean, are they going to, if the, again, it comes back to oversight and public monies and how they're, how they're spent. They are specifically looking at this, but in the context of the wider review, but they, they have given an undertaking that they're looking at this issue within that wider review. Okay, um, just, just in relation to that, S similar to the, the, the settlement for the uh, bogus self-employment, who are RT actually accountable to? RT are accountable to the department, but they're also to the BAI, yeah. to ourselves, but also to the BAI, and also New Era has a role in monitoring them. Um, we, we need to be... This, this is... Um, an area where we need to exercise some caution as well, because obviously, as we mentioned before, about public sector broadcasting, the importance of it being independent, that is really critical, that, oh, yes. that, that no, it is I, at arm's length. So it does I would accept to us, that. I would accept general. that. But when serious issues, such as the ones I've outlined, yes. you know, and they're not minor issues, let's be honest, they're accountable to yourselves when it comes to That's that. Right. And my query is that, you know, the, the, the settlement with revenue and the ongoing investigation with the Department of Social Protection and then the pay disparity, that all was all going on and costing public money and the manner in which public money was spent under your nose, if you like, and there was no action taken from your department. That's what's worrying. Well, it wouldn't be that there'd be no action taken by our department. We engage very extensively and very regularly with RT and where issues arise, we raise them with them. And they, they have taken a series of actions here to rectify and to address these issues. Um, Deputy, and our role would be where issues arise that, that A, they're identified and B, they're acted on. So were you aware of both of those issues before? I mean, the, the pay disparity has been going on for two decades and the... the the um, misclassification of workers. For how many years were you aware of those two? Well, again, as I would say, RT has only come under the remit of this department since 2020. So obviously both those issues predate that time. Deputy, your time is up. Um, hopefully it'll be time to come back in uh, okay. later on. Um, can I move to... Uh, James O'Connor is not with us yet, I think. Uh, yes. So I'll move to NASA Hurricane. No, um, Colin Burke. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. Um, and thank you indeed for your presentation here this morning to the department. Um, can I just ask the question in relation to um, sports capital grants um, and the under uh, spend in 2020? Um, I think it's 14 million. Um, there was a 14 million underspend out of um, 28 million. Um, and I'm just concerned about that um, because all of the uh, grants that are provided to sporting bodies, 
you know, it's essential for, you know, to continue to upgrade facilities. Um, and I'm just wondering why wasn't there any provision made for them to carry that over um, to allow them time to complete those projects? Was there a particular reason as to why that wasn't extended? Um, Deputy, what I would say, and I, I'll ask my colleague Kian Olinon to come in in more detail on this. Um, what I would say under the under the um, public spending code, uh, there, there is provision to carry over funding for the department. A percentage of its capital funding can be carried over from one year to the next. And also the projects, uh, and we carried over, I think, 7.6 million um, in from 2020 into 2021. Um, but also projects, just because the year ends doesn't mean they lose their funding. The commitment to funding those projects remains. And obviously, uh, COVID played a really played havoc with some of the uh, ability of some of the sports um, clubs to uh, to actually draw down their money to to, uh, to get match funding, um, to get um, construction contracts in place. Um, I might ask Keen to come in in more detail, but uh, I would say that when you have a grant, the grant pertains, the grant continues, whether it's this year or next year, your commitment to the grant continues. And if there's a question of you not being able to draw down the grant, we engage very extensively. And ultimately, we would take the grant back eventually, but only as a last resort. Um, so maybe, Kian, you want to come in in more detail there? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Sir Jen. Um, Deputy, the Secretary General has emphasised the most important point on, in all of this is that uh, Due to the cyclical nature of how sports capital grants are awarded, pay, drawn down and paid, uh, there can often be underspend, but no, no uh, individual club will ever miss out. Um, there is due process given to them. Um, it can take them a number of years to draw down grants. So, for instance, we currently have over 2,000 older grants on the system dating back a number of years, and there, there's potentially more than 60 million payable there. But that might, those individual grants might not be drawn down for a number of years. Individual clubs might have legal issues that they need to clarify in conjunction with the chief state solicitor. There might be questions of match funding, etc. But we take a very sympathetic approach to them that if, if, if a club has been validly awarded a grant, we'll do everything to try and work with them to make sure that it can be drawn down. So in terms of the underspend, um, we, we, uh, we carried over uh, as much of the underspend as we're allowed to on, on, under public accounting rules. Uh, but the bottom line is that no club will miss out, uh, and we are constantly working with them to, to encourage them to draw down and then to manage budgets over, over successive years. Yeah. Can I just come back to you on that? And that's in relation to the grants, the, the applications for grants that have now been submitted. And the, I suppose there are two issues now in relation to uh, voluntary organisations submitting for grant applications. One, having submitted the applications before the rise in building costs. And then the second oh. challenge that they have is that they're not able to do the same level of fundraising. And, uh, you know, is the department going to make provision and be, I suppose, um, be more aware of the challenges that organisations now have uh, and therefore um, taking that into account and to dealing with these applications and the carryover. Um, I might fo follow on there, Deputy, and, and respond to that. Um, yes, we're, we're very aware of the pressures that the applicants have and um, the closing date for the sports capital current round was the 1st of March. Um, we have been pushing to try and have those grants awardable uh, this side of Christmas. Uh, it is now possible that it might be in the early weeks of January before that happens. Um, what Minister Chambers is trying to do uh, is to ensure that there is as much funding as possible there to, to, to recognise the increased costs and to ensure that those valid applicants get uh, a sufficient amount that will enable them to proceed with, with their project. Um, so one of the key jobs we're doing over the next few weeks is, is to maximise uh, that pot um, and I'm sure the minister might be having uh, bilateral conversations with, with ministers with deeper pockets, anything to, to, to ensure that we can maximise the, um, the round that will be announced in January. And can I just ask in relation to the grant applications that were made on the 1st of March, and I know that there's been allocation already, I think it was a 40 million euros was available and 16 million has already gone out or been allocated in relation to um, equipment. 
is it possible that these applications will be dealt together with the budget for 2022? I know you can't give me a, a, an answer that this will happen, but I'm just asking, is it feasible rather than people going back and having to do the whole process all over again in 2022, that you do it as a, as a two-year project rather than as a one-year project in view of the, you know, the restrictions that have been on uh, voluntary organisations over the last uh, 18 months? Um, as you said, Deputy, um, the equipment grants were announced, were announced in August, amounting to 16 million, um, and that was a subset of what was the largest ever round and largest ever ask we've received under Sports Capital. Um, we are finalising the process of review of those. They, uh, those who have applied under that process, there, there's nothing further for them to do right now. There has been a lot of interaction with them since the 1st of March. Uh, because, as you probably know, there, there is now an opportunity for clubs to mend their hand if they've made an administrative or other error in their application. Um, so, really, the critical thing for us is to maximise the available pot of, fund, uh, of funding uh, for, for, for what will probably be an early January announcement. Uh, that's our number one uh, ask of others and task for ourselves to ensure that we can give every, every valid club um, as much as possible to, to, to allow their projects to proceed. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and in fact, uh, sorry. Deputy, could I just add on that? Um, like the Sports Capital Programme has delivered over 13,000 projects since it began in 1998 to the tune of a billion. Our business is to try and get the money out to the clubs for the betterment of communities. That is what we do. And Keen and the team, every time there's a round of the Sports Cap, they review to see how did it work, what went well, what didn't go well, all with with a view to what's working for communities, what's working for clubs in order to get good infrastructure out to them. Uh, well, we'll I, continue I, that. I was at a project last Sunday week, in fact, which was opening a new community facility and there was a €130,000 grant um, made by the Department of that and, you know, it, it's a it's a huge contribution for that project, which cost over 460 million, so very much, or 460,000, so 130,000 from the Department, very welcome. Can I just move on to the um, capital culture issue? And I'm just wondering, do we learn from previous experiences? I happen to have been Lord Mayor of Cork in 2003, 2004, and in 2005, 2000. In 2006, um, uh, Cork had the um, European Capital of Culture, and the same mistakes seem to have been made in Galway as what were made in Cork back in 2005-2006. And I'm just wondering, surely the department should have a kind of a protocol in place so that there's a clear plan about projects like this, rather than trying to make them up as we go along, because that seems to have happened with Galway. And, you know, the same thing happened down in Cork, and I'm being upfront about it. Uh, and we could get a far better delivery on these projects if we did clear plan rather than making them up. And I'm just wondering, have the department looked at that, and especially about getting in European funding? And there is European funding for um, culture and all of that. And I'm not sure if we're, we're, we're making every effort to get that funding in. So maybe you might outline what engagement have we at European level and also about having uh, uh, the appropriate structures in place when we do get funding in and uh, making sure that we're getting good value for money. Thank you, Deputy, and uh, thank you for raising this issue and, and liaising, of course, with the... Um uh, or, or referring back to Cork, when Cork was a successful bidder for the European Capital of Culture, of course we learned from previous from previous capitals of culture, and we had a, a national capital of culture in Limerick um, back in 2014, um, and that and that there was a review of that which absolutely fed into Galway 2020. We had very very robust governance arrangements, a lot of consultation in the run up to Galway 2020. Uh, the European Commission itself actually runs a kind of a compendium of all of the findings of the various different European cities of culture in order to inform whatever country is doing it at whatever given time. Obviously, it comes around maybe only once every 15 years, so it's important that that's done. This time, for the first year ever, um, the Commission um, has looked for member states to do a review immediately afterwards. We have a review which is nearing completion now of Galway City of Culture, and that'll be really important to input, not just for us, but for other member states. Um, but I would say with Galway City of Culture, um, 
like what really went wrong was COVID with 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 the uh, Galway City culture, and notwithstanding that, they did produce an astounding an array of events. Uh, a lot of artists and artistic uh, workers pivoted to online, reached huge audiences uh, worldwide. Actually, that they mightn't have uh, they mightn't have actually reached otherwise. So there were some benefits to it. But absolutely, I might ask Connor to come in in more detail. But just to say, it was what did proceed proceeded really well and I think people will be familiar with some of the larger events um, that, that Connor like Druid Gregory um, and uh, the Galway Arts Festival and uh, Mockness. Yeah, can yes, I just say could. that, that the, the deputy's time is up so we could have just a short response. Yeah, absolutely. Just, just to assure the deputy, we, as, as the secretary has pointed out, we we do draw on the learnings. There are reviews of all European cities of culture. There was a national city of culture. We review those in terms of designing of the the, the service okay. level, level agreements, etc. So all of that is factored in to our design. But it is challenging, and um, just to acknowledge that. Okay. Um, thank you I, very much. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, deputy. Um, uh, I just again, just James O'Connor. Um, I know he's in the chamber, NASA Hurricane. Um, I'll, I'll move on to Matt Carty. Is Matt, Matt Carty's not there? Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Thanks, th thanks, Cahirlock, and again, thanks to our guests um, for for being here. I just want to touch briefly on RTE again to fo follow up. Um, I take it it's your department that RTE come to um, in terms of their requests for increase in the licence fee? Is that correct? Yes, correct. Yeah. So in terms of the discussions around the licence fees, are there any deliberations or conversations in relation to the expenditures of monies that RTE are currently in receipt of? Uh, well, as I said previously, we have extensive oversight and monitoring arrangements in relation to RTE, which is now, but having, uh, and at the same time, respecting the arm's length principle that they are public sector broadcasting, and it's important that that arm's length is there. Um, we are looking, the Future Media Commission, which is established by the government, is looking at the longer term funding of media in Ireland, including public sector broadcasting. Um, so that includes looking at the licence fee model. Um, yeah, so I'm more concerned in terms of the accountability for monies that are um, are already allocated under the current system. I think um, one of your um, one of your um, members um, mentioned in relation to, for example, the issue with revenue, um, that you're happy that a process is in place. Um, are, are you satisfied that an adequate process with relation to um, um, salary structures and employment statuses wasn't in place um, for quite a number of years? Um, and at any point during that time, would your department have had any direct um, contact with RT in relation to what were, for a long period of time, um, questions with regard to the salary structure within RTE and the, um, and the bo and the employment structures, particularly in relation to self-employment statuses, um, and would that issue have been um, um, raised with RTE at any point? As I mentioned earlier, Deputy, RTE and the broadcasting function we came under the remit of this department as constructed last year, so these issues predated it coming into this department. Um, and, and as I would say, the key thing is where issues are arisen, arise, that they're identified, that the systems are in place, A, to identify them, B, and then B, that they're dealt with swiftly once they are identified. And the, the issue in relation to the contracts, as I understand, and to our engagement with RTE, and indeed PAC's own engagement with RTE, the matter has been dealt with with revenue and is continuing to be dealt with with the Department of Social Protection. So the question I have is, so you mentioned when, when, when issues um, are identified, um, what process is in place to identify issues, in, particularly in relation to um, employment contracts? So we would have regular meetings, regular governance, quarterly governance meetings with RTE. Um, the BAI also has a role um, as the regulator in relation to RTE and fulfilment of its commitments. Um, and then obviously RTE produces an annual report and accounts which are audited. Um, and they are all the regular governance structures that are in place. 
um, in order to track developments and, and, and identify emerging issues. Okay, so in terms of the governance meetings, how does that work with regard to employment contracts? Would they be raised at govern governance meetings? Um, I, uh, on this particular issue, obviously, they would probably be discussed um, at the governance meeting. I might ask Patricia, maybe she wants to comment any further on that. But where an issue uh, is arising, which is a governance issue, of course, it's discussed at a, a governance meeting. To add any more to that? Patricia, coming in. Have we... Doesn't um, uh, appear to, to be there. So, so clearly, um, the issue in relation to bogus self-employment um, didn't arise. Am I correct to say, um, as a result of the governance meeting structure that was in place? I'm not, I'll have to come back to you because obviously this, as I said before, this did predate my role as accounting officer here in relation to RTE because we this department's only had RTE in the last year or so. Okay. Um, so I'll come back so to you as to exactly when it was identified. But but there are layers of governance structures, which includes annual report and account, audit. These are all really important layers. They're there to identify these issues. So whether they're identified by us or whether they're identified in the audit process or in the annual report and accounts, the whole point is that you have the systems there, that it is picked up some way. Um, and, and this issue has been picked up and has been dealt with and is being dealt with. Yes, so that, that's what I'm just trying to find. So are you satisfied that it was the governance structures through, and they, can you point perhaps to the annual report where RTE outlined the issue with regard to the, the, the dispute with over um, self-employment status of their staff? Sorry, what was the first part of the question there? Sorry. So in terms of the governance structures that you're talking about that are in place, and you mentioned the audit reports uh, or the audit reports and the annual reports, um, can you point to which audit report or annual report actually highlighted the issue with regard to the potential outlay to revenue regarding the employment contracts? What I will do, Deputy, I'll come back to you on that, because as I said, this issue predated my time with RTE, so I'll come back to you with exactly when it first emerged and how it first emerged. Okay, right thanks for that. that. So, Thank so in that regard then, in terms of the current gover governance meetings, so um, how many times a year would the governance meetings take place? There would be four formal meetings a year, um, but then there'd obviously be regular engagement in between that, as there are with all our agencies. So who attends those governance meetings? The governance meetings are attended by our RTE governance unit, which is um, our finance officer um, who has responsibility at the moment for the governance of RTE. And who do they meet with? With, the, with RTE, with the senior executives in RTE. Okay. Um, so at those meetings, do the, does the issue of employment, considering that we now know that there is a substantial payment being made to revenue, do those governance meetings um, address um, the um, safeguards to ensure that there won't be further outlays in that regard? Well, the purpose of the governance meeting is where there where there are governance issues, governance issues arising, to actually discuss them and discuss what measures the agency is taking or the company or the organisation is taking in order to address the issues. So, absolutely, there would be an update at every at meetings. Okay, so are you satisfied then that there are no outstanding issues um, that could result in a future outlay to revenue um, with regard to employment contracts? I, I, I would have to say, Deputy, for an accounting officer to say they're ever satisfied that there's no outstanding issues on anything would probably be probably wouldn't be reasonable. Um, what I can say is that the governance arrangements are in place. There's layers of governance there, and the purposes of those layers of governance is to identify the issues. Okay, so this, so this, uh, this is where I'm having um, a bit of confusion because you said is that the, at the governance meetings, issues that have been identified are raised, um, but I'm not sure of the structure that ensures that issues can be um, um, can be caught early, if you like. Um, in other words, that they can be addressed before they're actually raised. So, um, um, in with specifically in terms of contracts. Um, I, I hear what you're saying in terms of you can't be satisfied uh, or ever satisfied that something can't be possible. Are you satisfied that the governance structures 
um, are in place Two that minutes, would um, quickly and swiftly identify issues and address them. I, I'm satisfied, Deputy, that we have gov good governance structures in place in respect of RTE. Don't forget, it's not just the fact that we have a governance, we have our own arrangements with the RTE and we have our quarterly governance meetings. You also have the role of the BAI. You also have the role, there, the production of an annual report and accounts that are audited. And you also have the role of New Era, which analyzes their accounts. So there is a robust governance and framework, framework in place for RTE and all our other agencies. Um, I'm sorry, and the the revenue issues. Time. One minute. Sorry. Chair, how long have I left? You're, you're one minute. Okay, thank you. So um, just on that, um, so could, perhaps you could just outline the role that the BAI and the New Era approach have in relation to staff contracts within RTE. You've mentioned them a number of times in relation to this matter. Well, BAI, uh, the BAI has, uh, has uh, or sorry, New Era has a role in terms of the finances, reporting on the finances and analysing financial issues relating to RTE. And, and the would, BAI, that include, um, would that include staff contracts? Where's Rose, where's Rose? But they wouldn't be getting into the detail of it. Like, this is a matter between RTE and the Revenue Commissioners and, and RTE and the Department of Social Protection. So the key, the key governance issue here has to be managed by RTE in consultation with the Revenue Commissioners and with the Social Protection. Um, so the, role, so the, back to us. So the, B, the BAI have no role either, is that correct in saying that? No, the BAI have a strong role in governance of In terms RTE. of um, staff contracts? In terms of, well, they would be aware, I assume, of the staff contracts issue. Uh, BAI's role in RT is around their commitments in terms of their, their strategy and delivering on their commitments and their strategy. Deputy but obviously, they'd be aware of the issue in relation to the staff contracts. See, but as I said, is, this is an the issue. The difficulty where... is in terms of public money, which is taxpayers' money, 1.2 million euro of taxpayers' money has actually gone back to revenue um, um, through, um, 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 through a, a settlement. And yeah, there may be others. And I have to yeah. say, I'm not satisfied that we can be sure that the mechanisms are in place to make sure that, um, that outstanding issues will be addressed quickly or that future issues won't arise. Well, I think it's fair to say that Orti has put a comprehensive process in place to actually address this issue. Yep. Um, I, I can't get, I can't get into the weeds of RTE to find out each individual contract and, and to look and see, is this right, isn't it wrong? We rely on them to put in place a good process to engage with revenue, to engage with social protection, and there's a very, very extensive engagement has gone on there and is continuing to go on in order to address the issues. OK, um, thank you very much. Uh, there should be time to come back in later on, Deputy. Um, I, I, maybe we could move to uh, Deputy Cormac Devlin, uh, and when Deputy Devlin finishes, we'll we'll then go for a, a ten minute break. Good to and uh, welcome to Miss Licken and uh, your team. Um, good to see many of you again uh, at the uh, at the public accounts. Uh, and at the outset, I just want to say that you, you referred to it in your own opening remarks about the breadth of your organisation. So uh, for each of the members of the committee, I know some members have focused in on RTE and others on the um, European Capital of Culture 2020. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, touch on a number of other elements uh, within both the accounts uh, and, and other areas. Uh, the first I just wanted to touch on was something I raised in the last um, time we, we engaged, and that was around the TV licence. And obviously things have changed in terms of the pandemic and the need for inspectors to do other works. But I'm just wondering how long were the TV inspectors um, kind of suspended from their, their ordinary works uh, during the course of the pandemic? And also what impact did that suspension of TV licence inspections have on the collection rate of uh, 2020 and 2021? That'll be my first question. You're just, sorry, you're just on mute there. Apologies, Deputy. Um, so the TV licence fee receipts are comprised of two components. The contribution from the Department of Social Protection in respect of the free licences issued under the Household Benefit Schemes and then the direct uh, sales by and post. Um, so in terms of 2020, 
in the period from the 13th of March to the end of 2020, inspectors could only operate as normal for two months. Um, they were off the road completely for four months and they operated on a non-contact basis for three and a half months. So that was uh, like cards and letter boxes, but not actually knocking on doors. And then in 2021, there was no activity by the license inspectors for four months, no physical activity at the doors. Um, and non-contact then uh, only resumed on the 10th of May and full inspections resumed from the 14th of June. So obviously this did have an impact on the license fee receipts. Uh, so we see, um, if I just have a look at my note here, a um, uh, sharp decline in sales for the first half of the year, uh, marginal recovery in the middle of the year, this is in 2020 when restrictions eased, and the second lockdown was put in place in, then in autumn 2020, which meant that sales didn't recover to the levels expected. Um, so the fact that license fee uh, revenue remains static at 222 million in 2020 is largely due to the exchequer increased exchequer contribution from the Department of Sub and, Social and, Protection. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and and just on that point, then, um, because it's it's the first I first time I've heard them uh, known as sales. I don't know if the people who pay them would exactly classify them as sales. But uh, could I just say, um, in in terms of the money that hasn't that hasn't been collected. Is there a plan to try and uh, kind of collect that at some point? Well, obviously, uh, on post is is um, that's a matter for on post. And yes, I would assume. So, if you haven't paid your TV license, um, you uh, you haven't paid your TV license, and you're liable to pay your license. So, so T I I uh, on post will be uh, pursuing that. So there, there's a collection agent. Okay, that's fine. There is a collection agent. Uh, okay, so. Uh, uh, then moving on then to the decade of centenaries, uh, and that's something that we've engaged again before on. Um, but in terms of uh, the specific projects that you know the department is engaged with, uh, can you give us a, an outline of expenditure to date on that topic, please? Okay, so I might ask Connor to come in in more detail on this, um, but obviously the Decade of Centenaries is a really important programme um, that that we lead on in this department. Um, we had a comprehensive programme of events and initiatives in 2020 um, across 31 local authorities, and we increased the funding to the local authorities in 2021 uh, to 50,000 per local authority, so 2 million in funding for the local authorities in general. Um, so to date, we've had a key key exhibitions, outreach programs, digitization programs in our national cultural institutions, and including a recent partnership with the uh, National Archives of Ireland and the Embassy in London on the Anglo-Irish Treaty. We have a new artist in resident program in a number of the cultural institutions, the military archives, and, beyond, and of course, there's the Beyond 22. 2022 project, which is the uh, the uh, the records that were burned 100 years ago. We have a new national poetry project, which has been launched in partnership with UCD and Poetry Ireland. We have the well-established Manaw 100 new online platform, um, and we have a range of partnerships with rich online content, which has been really important over the last two, year, two years in partnership with Boston College and with the RTE. Um, Given the importance then of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, a range of activity will be rolled out in the coming weeks, including the current production of the, the treaty at the National Concert Hall, a groundbreaking production with Anu and Theo Dorgan on the treaty debates, which will go live at the end of this year and into 2023, a new concert at the Concert Hall featuring contemporary... Uh, yes, yeah, sorry? Yeah, sorry, just in, ter just in terms of... The, I, I'm, I'm familiar with the number of those projects, sure. and, and they are, you're right, it is very, very important. And I, I recognise your department's involvement in that. But I'm just wondering, in terms of expenditure, do we have a figure of how much has been uh, allocated or has been spent to date? Um, we have five million. Connor, do you have the figure to date? I mean, the figure for this year, um, we increased funding from two million to five million. I don't know, Connor, if you want to comment any further. Yeah, the, the figure is five. I don't have the precise spend at the moment, Deputy, but the... You might send the, us a note on it, please, if you wouldn't we mind. We will, of course, and yeah. it's based to some extent on the drawdown by the local authorities, but we are yeah. chasing them at present to ensure... Of course, yeah, and, and they're they're hampered too, I, I accept that. Um, just while I, I see uh, Ms. Benotti there, and we spoke before about Creative Ireland, 
And I just, um, since we last spoke, I just want to commend uh, the work, particularly on the 24 Desh schools uh, on Fighting Words, that programme that was that was very well received, as well as the Creative Youth Projects and others. And I think it's important to acknowledge that work. Uh, again, Connor mentioned the local authorities. It's important that there's good collaboration between the department uh, and indeed uh, Creative Ireland. So thank you for that. If I can just turn then to the appropriation account, um, there's a note here about... Um, six contracts to the value of 578,000 um, euro uh, for non-compliance. Now, the majority of that was cleaning and other utility contracts. Um, but the sixth work relates to genealogy, genealogy services in the National Archives of Ireland, and it's now been retendered. Could you just outline what happened in that regard? And then there's another nine contracts as well, but I'll get on to that in a second, please. Sorry, Deputy, if you can just bear with me a second. I have a note on all of these, um, which I just can't locate. Um, but I suppose, oh yeah, I have it here, sorry. So um, just to say on those projects, actually, um, a lot of, I suppose,